Well, it's good to be here with you today. I've been at your parish a number of times. It's always good to come back. Our heart's truest desire is where we meet God. Our heart's truest desire is where we meet God. Those deep recesses of our heart is the sources of humanity's most noble aspirations and our deepest sorrows. Because in the deep recesses of our heart is where we encounter the living God and our truest self. But we can fall into a fatal error as Christians is to pretend that we have found the life that we prize already. We settle. The fatal error is to pretend that we have found the life we prize and we compromise or pretend or settle. But as Catholics, we're called to live in reality because God is real. The reality of self, the reality of sin, the reality of God, of life and eternity, of where we are called. We are called in this reality as Catholics to live Christian holiness. And to quote St. John Paul II, sometimes we have a misconstrued understanding of holiness. This saint and pope states this, Christian holiness does not mean being sinless, but rather it means struggling not to give in and always getting up after every fall. Holiness does not stem so much from the effort of a man's will as from the efforts to never restrict the action of grace in one's own soul and to be, moreover, grace's humble partner. We can take an example from the life of Jesus himself, Although sinless, taking on our sins of humanity for all of eternity, carrying the cross, going into Golgotha, he fell once, twice, three times. But each time, after the fall, he got back up, put on his cross, and proceeded on to Calvary. He fell again, put on his cross, got up, and proceeded on to Calvary. A third time, the same action. This is uh, an example to us of what we should do as we're striving and growing in holiness as people who are baptized. That it means that we're not, Christian holiness does not mean being sinless, but getting up after every fall and becoming grace's humble partner. You and I would do well that after every fall is to ask ourselves some very basic questions. Why did I do what I just did? What was I really looking for? Because, you know, after the fact, you're like, it really wasn't the sin you really wanted. There's something underneath that you're pursuing. Every lay Christian is an extraordinary work of God's graces and is called to the heights of holiness. Every, each and every one of us here Baptized members of the body of Christ are called to heroic holiness. You and I are chosen by the Lord in a mysterious but real way to make you saviors with him and like him because you and I are members of the body of Christ. We're to continue his work out into the world, first starting with our own selves and our family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, and the world beyond. Yes, Christ calls you, but he calls you in truth. His call is demanding because he invites you to let yourselves be captured by him so completely that your whole lives will be seen in a different light. Let yourselves be seized by Jesus and try to live just for him. Have you ever met people who seem to have this relationship with Christ? They've been captured. He's been captured by them or letting themselves be captured by him. I don't know if you've met people like that. They seem to radiate a certain glow, a certain light, a certain joy. Despite what's going on in their life, they are people of hope, people of faith, of love. These are people that, in this demanding call of baptism, they let themselves be captured by Christ so completely that their lives are seen in a whole different light. 
You and I need to allow ourselves to be seized by Jesus and to try to live just for him. So part of this is you and I need to stir up and complete these graces that all of us have received in baptism. Each and every one of you here, from the youngest baptized member to the eldest, has gifts of the Holy Spirit, gifts given to share in the very life of the, of the divinity, to share in the life of the Holy Trinity, and to exercise those gifts and graces out in the world and to grow in holiness, to grow in Christian discipleship and maturity. I would like to propose that there are four areas in our life that oftentimes can clutter or rob these baptismal graces, this call to holiness, a call to heroic life in Christ, a call to mature discipleship, even if you want to call it human excellence. There are four areas. They're not exhaustive. Persistent sin is the first area. This is one of the beauties of going to confession on a regular basis. You start to recognize, I always have these two or three sins in my life. Why is that? Maybe unique to me or to you, your temperament, how you were raised, personal sins that you've chosen in the past, sins done against you that have wounded you. And oftentimes we choose these particular sins because they're a place in where we're trying to self-heal. It emanates usually these sins, they're places of insecurities or places where we feel incompetent or places where we're deeply wounded. So when we go to regular confession, we start to see them rise up. They're always there. And we have to ask ourselves the question, why do I choose these sins? Because they never deliver. As one priest says, sins are like a trailer of a bad movie. They promise a lot, but they never deliver. And so why do we choose them time and time again? You have yours, I have mine. <clears throat> These sins can rob us of greatness in Christ, heroic holiness, and human excellence. The second area would be intense activities. Well, we busy ourselves so much that we're living kind of on the surface of life, like a static of life. We can't hear God. We can't even hear our own heart. We're not very present to other people because we're living on the surface of life. Intense activities, persistent sins. These things rob us of heroic holiness, our baptismal call, our baptismal graces, human excellence. The next is our attachment to things inordinate attachment to things. We, get, we allow things to clutter our lives. These things become more important than people around us or our relationship with God, or they preoccupy our time, our space, our energies. I mean, God wants us to have nice things, but you and I know that when we can have a disordered attachment to things, we lack freedom. For some people here in this room, and maybe you're, you always go out shopping, and that's your way of kind of thera therapy for yourself. For somebody else, it's just a preoccupation with something you just got. For other people, it's people, a certain attachment to individuals. You know, there's one priest I work with, Father Hewer, he says, we all have good friendships or easy friendships or hard friendships. Hard friendships are those people that you see the phone ringing and you're like, um, I don't know if I really want to answer this phone call. Because you know there's going to be drama. These are people who seem to kind of like suck the energy out of you. You really don't want to be with them. And out of charity, every once in a while you'll talk to them. These are hard friendships. If we are more heroic in our holiness, if you and I were more mature in our discipleship, we may, out of charity, then talk to these individuals and say, what's going on in your life? You live your life this way. There's always drama. There's always problems. You're never happy. What's really going on? You could be an agent of God's grace to heal and free them. Easy friendships are those people that you just delight to be with. You love it when they call. You may have not seen them for months, but when they're there present to you at a dinner party or here at the parish, it's like you picked up 
where you left off. They energize you. They give you life. These are easy friendships. Another area would be personal habits of our life. Some habits we know in our life are good. Things are well-ordered. It allows the best of me to come forward. But there are certain habits that are undermining that you and I in honesty need to look at and say, I need to rid myself of them. These are undermining habits would be places in which um, we often react to the environment around us. Undermining habits are places in which we try to self-defend against other people. Or we try to, uh, let's uh, give an example, you're having guests over for dinner, but the whole house has to be immaculate. Everything has to be placed in proper order, lest they think ill of me. Now, it's good to have standards of good hygiene, (laughs) order, the house cleaned. But an undermining habit is like a preoccupation. Like, I'll, I'll feel less loved, less honored, less respected, unless this is in order. So you and I need to look at these four areas of life that are clutters, that rob us of excellence in Christ, our baptismal grace is maturing in us, and living human excellence, persistent sins, intense activities, an inordinate attachment to things or certain individuals, and personal habits that are undermining to our own human excellence and maturity of discipleship in Christ. All these four areas rob us, again, of human excellence. They stunt the growth of virtue in our lives. They impede the work of grace. They impoverish and misdirect our relationships with God, with others, even in our own self-knowledge. They keep us all on the surface of life, this phonetic clutter, chaos, static. Again, we don't know our own heart. God seems far from us, and we feel alone because we're not letting others in and not letting ourselves be known and loved. God is calling us to higher standards of excellence and to live out an intentional discipleship in our own lives. God is desirous to do in us what he's done in the greatest of saints he intends to do in you and me. We need to be like Isaiah in our first reading from Isaiah chapter 6 or in Mark's Gospels today where Peter, Simon Peter, James and John, Isaiah left everything to follow Christ. Their livelihood, their own what was knowledgeable or familiar to them. God became the dominant person, relationship, aspect by which all other things flow in their life. We need to encounter Christ, or I would say the Holy Trinity, in a new way. It'd be like St. Augustine, who had lived a life of debauchery, a life of arrogance, of pride, until he encountered Christ in a new, real, personal way. Some of you are very familiar with his life and his book, The Confessions. There's a one famous part in his confessions is so beautiful. It talks about a life that's been in, encountered and captured by Jesus. St. Augustine says this, You shouted out and broke through my deafness. You burned brightly and chased away my blindness. You breathed your fragrance upon me, and even now do I yearn for you. You touched me, and I burned for your peace. You have made me, O God, to live forever in your life, love. You have made me, O God, to live forever in your love, and my heart will not rest until it rests in you. God is quite determined to carry that same sentiment out into you and, and into me, through us to others. If you listen to this homily and you look at these clutches of your life, I would suggest two things. <clears throat> One would be is go home today and have some time of quiet 
and enter into the deep recesses of your heart, those places where your deep desires are. And in prayer, just bring them simply to the Lord in conversation. And let him speak to your heart. For some of you who are more mature in your prayer life, you know God's voice. It's different than my voice or your own voice or the voice of the tempter. Usually when God speaks to the heart, he doesn't demand. He's not critical. He doesn't shout. But God's voice has a certain truthfulness to it. There's peace associated with it. One small word from him says everything. It has staying power. It lingers. And it brings a certain sense of joy and rightness to you. Even if it's a correction, you're like, yes, that's the Lord. For others of you, maybe you're not hearing anything if you did that. Those deep recesses of your heart, you haven't listened to them for a long time. You say your prayers, but you haven't gone deep. It's not a critique, it's just sometimes that's where we're at. And I can't hear my own heart, nor the Lord. I would suggest for you then this second thing. Say this simple prayer. It's going to sound odd at first. God, I give you permission. Hmm. I give you permission for you to enter deeply into my life where I'm in most of need of healing, where I'm most unfree, where I'm most wounded. You see, if you ever look at sacred scripture in an intimate way, Jesus never demands people be saved. He doesn't demand that they come into his kingdom. He invites. Because God has given us a gift called free will. So this prayer is an act of your free will, an act of faith. God, I give you permission to enter this place of my life where I'm unfree, unhealed, I'm deeply wounded, where I, where I overreact when someone points out a fault or a misstep, a place where I often turn to sin to self-heal. This is a place where we're often guarded, shielding ourselves from God, ourselves, and others. When we do that, we allow then the baptismal graces that all of us have received, the gifts of the Holy Spirit that all of us have received at baptism, and the plan that God has in our life to bear fruit more fully, more powerfully, more intimately, our faith becomes more alive. And then God is given permission to do in us what he's done in the greatest of saints that he intends to do with you. St. Ignatius of Loyola says this, There are very few people who realize what God could make of them if they abandoned themselves into his hands and let themselves be formed by his grace. There are very few people who realize what God would make of them if they abandoned themselves into his hands and let themselves be formed by his grace. It's never too late to begin. It's never too late to start. It's never too late to con continue in your maturity and discipleship and in Christ. It's a process. But God is determined to pursue you. We just have to open the doors of our hearts and let them in. Our work is receptivity. It's really not that hard, but we have to be open to hear what he wants to say.